Well, you know, I think between uh, all my competition aerobatic flying and all my warbird flying, I guarantee you, I've met, I've known, I've had friends or acquaintances, probably a hundred people that are no longer here. There's a lot of ways uh, flying can be fatal, and uh, you know, we've all probably done stupid things, things we regretted. Self-discovery is the best form of learning. Uh, but at the same time, we can self-discover from other people's mistakes as well. You know, as long as it, as long as we discover something from it. Um, one of the things uh, that's obviously a big issue is VMC into. IMC. VMC and IMC can happen to a very qualified instrument pilot that's not prepared to en enter the IMC conditions. A VMC into IMC can uh, happen unintentionally, but when it happens, it can happen really fast. It's something I think every pilot at some point pushes, whether they uh, get into trouble or not. I think we've all probably pushed our nose a little bit to where we have all made the decision to turn around, and I think that's a smart one. BMC and IMC, we often think about pilots that do not possess instrument ratings. However, the data shows that pilots of all certificate levels have gotten themselves into a bad outcome by inadvertently flying into IMC conditions. It's very easy to avoid. It's a decision that we can, we can make on the ground before we get in the air not to do. You know, we discussed a little bit earlier about, you know, not specifically scud running, but at least flying down to minimums, always having an out, you know, and of course, uh, if you are a thousand feet, three miles, then at least, you know, if you do punch into the clouds a little bit and you have to go below, at least you've got an opportunity to turn around and take that, uh, that course of action. But if you're way lower, uh, then it could be a big issue. I was flying along with a, uh, we'd come back from an aerobatic contest and we had uh, three pits. Uh, the one guy uh, uh, who was local, we stayed at his house and he had to, uh, he left his airplane but he had to take, a, I think it was like a Cherokee or a Piper 140 or something, down to a place that was only like 30 or 40 miles away. And he was familiar with the area, it was in the Atlanta area. My friend and I threw our maps in the back thinking, well, we're just going to follow this guy. And we basically were following him. I had no clue where we were because I didn't have a map. And, you know, we were about 2,000 feet. You know, we kind of punch into the cloud, the base of the cloud. And then we'd, so we dropped down, punch in again. We dropped down, we punched in again. I had no idea. I knew we were getting within about 10 minutes of where we were supposed to go. And long and the short of it was we were over the trees. I mean, I was like 100 feet over the trees. And all of a sudden, and every time we went into the cloud, because I was a great formation pilot, I would pull in on the guy. <laughs> and so what happened was we just kept going down and down and down. And all of a sudden, I and the Cherokee, we poofed. We went into the clay. It was, on, it was down to the ground. I sucked in on the guy, we did a formation 180 degree instrument turn 100 feet above the trees. My friend was lagging back and he turned quickly. He was circling around out there and of course when we punched back out 180 degrees, you know, he hooked up on us and we followed some, I didn't know, I didn't have a map, I didn't know where we were going. So there was a lot of combination of circumstances but in the end, you know, my formation flying kept me, this guy was actually an airline pilot. <laughs> so I knew he could fly instruments. I couldn't because I didn't have the, wow. the capability. But, you know, I mean, I learned a major thing from that. That could have easily been an accident. So fortunately, I'm still here to tell the story. Anybody have any additional? Uh, I, I remember early in my uh, flight training, um, it was one of my first cross countries. And, and uh, matter of fact, I was from Miami. I think I was to fly to Immokalee or somewhere out there. There was a coal front moving in. And uh, it was moving in, but it was still further north. Called in, everything was VFR, all the forecast was VFR. By the time I took off out of Miami, and I would say probably about uh, 15, 20 minutes away, the cloud coverage moved in. I was a student pilot. 
And there's one thing I remember that my instructor taught me was to do that 180 and just get out of it. And I was concerned because I was a bit low and I was wondering, you know, where is the antennas? And this was my first time, Good. you know, flying in the clouds. And let me tell you, that moment scared the hell out of me where I just said, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm definitely going to make sure, one, I get my instrument <laughs> rating, but in addition to that, you just do a 180 and get out of it immediately. And I was just amazed to see that when I did that 180, I must have lost about a good four or 500 feet hmm. in the process. You know, as a student pilot, unskilled, and, 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 and that could have been a tough situation, you know, and, and I learned a valuable lesson from that. Correct. Sure. Yeah, I mean, VMC and IMC doesn't always mean that you're a VFR only or, or a private pilot without an instrument rating. Um, you know, I, I'm an instrument rated pilot, and I'm very much aware of the fact that I do not need to be flying in instrument conditions because I don't fly that much in instrument conditions. But I found myself before on the cross country going to a contest or an air show, and you really want to get there, and the weather keeps creeping down a little bit, and you keep resetting your personal minimums. Uh, the closer you get, you keep resetting them just a little bit more. And I think that's what happens a lot with VMC and the IMC. People are aware that the weather's not perfect. It doesn't, uh, you're not flying along and it's severe clear and all of a sudden, poof, you're in a cloud and it's mm -hmm. the only one in the sky. You make a series of conscious decisions that keep narrowing your plan B down to something that may not be a very desirable outcome. I was bringing an old 1946 Taylor Craft back from Pennsylvania and I was on top of a broken layer, those were big white puffy clouds here and there. And uh, you know, about halfway into the flight, I'm starting to see less green and more white. And uh, you know, I've got a kick and tailwind, and I know the weather forecast at home is good, and I can still see the ground. But uh, there came a point about 15 minutes later where I totally lost the ground. The only thing I could do was turn back. I was down on fuel. So I knew I couldn't make it back to where I needed to be. Um, mm. I, I essentially, my only option, if something were to happen, were to spin through the clouds and, and hope that I had enough distance there to recover. And uh, me and my maker had a lot of conversations <laughs> <laughs> during that flight. You know, please, if you just let me live through this, I promise I'll never do it again. And, uh, you know, that was an educational thing. I got lucky. There's a lot of people that, that put yeah. themselves in that position <clears throat> that, that don't get lucky. You know what else I've seen happen quite a bit? is you'll have pilots flying to an airport and, you know, get socked in and rather than t turning back, you know, 40, 50 miles, they're just punched straight through the clouds. Mm -hmm. um, in a busy uh, area, you know, Class C airspace or around, mm -hmm. you know, underneath Class B or whatever the case may be, and they'll just punch straight through, you know, through the clouds coming down and not say anything. And mm -hmm. I've seen it happen time and time again and it's, you know, it's just the fact of being lazy or, or, you know, not wanting to communicate or whatever, because you know, just fly, or even taking off. Hmm. They'll take off and say, all right, I know there's a layer, you know, from two to 4,000 feet, you know, I'll just take off, bus right through it, and, you know, VFR on top. And I've seen it happen time and time again. Really? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that intentional non-compliance is particularly scary in our industry but even I think the VMC and the inadvertent flying into bad weather comes from the, the pre-flight planning and preparation and really understanding the weather and the weather sources and and listening to them we also see in if you've got a, several pilots sitting around evaluating the weather seeing how well do you think we can go VFR I don't know we have a pilot association a uh, very active pilot association they fly out many many airplanes a couple times a week and it's interesting to see how the group makes decisions as to whether to go or not go and generally if you watch the group it only takes one of the senior members to say no it's a little iffy today why don't we just wait till next time on the other hand if, if that that the the go button gets pushed then then looking at the information even if the weather starts getting worse you know technically doesn't get into our brain from a you know a cognitive engineering standpoint but that group think takes over and it's it's not that bad so the question i always ask is whether it's an oil leak weather or any other situation how bad is that bad when do we call it that it's that bad we're not going to go or we're not going to fly this airplane 
and, and I think you know that weather issue really comes from the pre-flight preparation and planning stage. Yeah. For the, for the non-intentional, accidental <laughs> flight into it, the intentional stuff, well, that's another story. Yeah. Well, Barrington brought up a good point where everything was forecast to be right, but at the same time it changed, so right. we have to be aware of that. And I know, I think any of us with a lot of flight experience have have heard a forecast that was going to be one thing. We thought, well, let me just go poke my nose into it, and it turned out it was great. You know, so you can't always plan on, you know, they do the best forecasting they can, but things can change one side or the other. So I think, uh, you know, at least my, you know, my feeling is, you know, if you do go poke your nose in it, just make sure you've always got an out, and you set the, 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 the VFR minimums, you know, yeah. so. That's I've heard both you and Eric say that a couple times, have that plan B, have yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you yeah. always have to have, have, have that. I think that's great. Yeah. And if you put yourself in, you get lower and lower and lower, I mean, you know, you just you just need to always have an out. You always have to have an airport behind you. I agree. Yeah. So. Well, how do you think that that accidentally flying into IMC or low visibility conditions? How does that fit in with loss of control in flight? Loss of control is something where. It really boils back to proficiency. If we look at loss of control in flight, what we found is that pilots just aren't just flying along in cruise flight and all of a sudden lose control of their aircraft. What we find is there's a precipitating event that often isn't even that big of a deal, but it gets the pilot's attention. Certainly in a pilot's career, uh, when you're not instrument rated, uh, getting into a situation where you get into IMC conditions and you're either not competent, you're not rated, or you're not uh, current, you know, can certainly lead to instances of, of loss of control. The other area that we look at is the automation. They may be flying along on autopilot and not monitoring the autopilot, and they may be picking up, let's say, ice on their airplane and the autopilot is auto trimming, and, and the pilot's not paying attention. Next thing they know, the autopilot disconnects and the airplane is, is out of trim and ends up in an uh, unusual attitude or an, an out of control situation. Loss of control in flight has a direct relation to airman proficiency. Um, for us to maintain control of the aircraft, we have to be at the top of our games. We need to be getting adequate instruction. We need to be practicing uh, the things that we realize are our risk and our weaknesses. And a good way to do that is through our, our flight instructor during our flight reviews. You get pilots who haven't had actual flight time, let's say over the past year or two, their actual, you know, uh, IFR flight time is two to five hours actual. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a front coming through and they decide to, you know, fly through that front and it's a bit more turbulent than expected than what they can handle and they totally lose it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not so much lose it from the standpoint of uh, the aircraft but the ability to stay ahead of the aircraft in those yeah. conditions, adding you know, turbulence to the equation. And um, you know, I've seen that happen also. I've flown with some pilots who haven't really you know, flown that much into IMC conditions. And real quickly, you know, they're, they're, they're behind the airplane all of a sudden. You know, they don't have that mental focus of you know, what's required you know, inside the cockpit. And it happens really fast. Well, and it only takes one thing going wrong. It only takes yeah. the attitude indicator, you not trusting it just for a second. I investigated an accident years ago, and it was a fairly proficient instrument pilot. Uh, had a deadline to meet. He had a bunch of people there with him from, his, uh, from work. They had a, a place they had to be. It was 100-foot ceilings that morning. It was just really nasty. Um, rudder trim was the thing that led to that accident. The rudder trim being adjusted all to one side was just enough to make his mind uh, question what his body was experiencing. Hmm. Uh, it happened during takeoff uh, and, and that was a loss of control in flight. It was something very simple. In VFR conditions, rudder trim is just a nuisance. I mean, it, it can, you'll definitely feel it. It's not likely to make you, uh, make you have an accident. But uh, in IMC, uh, something that simple can throw you off your game plan. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Boy, that's, that's, that's really an interesting story. Um, I have an airplane with a glass cockpit with an uh, attitude heading and reference system versus a standard inclinometer ball. 
and it's it's an accelerometer. And the same thing happened to me. The rudder trim was was off by enough, and the inclinometer indicator, which is really an accelerometer, would I was not flying coordinated, so the AHARS was putting me in a bank. And just that conflicting information. Of course, I have a I have glass screens. Fortunately, I have backup traditional instruments, and I found myself not looking at the glass screens and using the backup instruments until I was able to evaluate, you know, why is this giving me conflicting information? Hmm. And I think, and it taught me a big lesson as well about the automated features in, in airplanes. I mean, they're becoming so sophisticated, and to understand what that information is telling us, you know, you think just because I'm an instrument pilot and I fly instruments all the time, number one, I'm single pilot in my airplane versus two or three pilots in a, in a big airliner that actually flies itself. And, you know, you look at being able to interpret that information and, and keeping that airplane upright with just, you know, one, one item out of balance. And the new equipment, it, it's very fancy, it looks great, but I, I think our making sure we're trained and very, very current and comfortable with it, uh, I, I think that really needs to be stressed because I think we're seeing in our loss of control and flight more and more accidents occurring in perfectly good airplanes mm -hmm. that have lots and lots of equipment That's in right. them, but either they don't take advantage of the automation or they've let the autopilot take them into a loss of control situation and, and not been able to recover from it. Hmm. That leads right into CFIT. Control flight and terrain is something that can be avoided, uh, but I honestly, you know, just from speaking with pilots and, and so forth, uh, more pilots should take it seriously. Control flight into terrain can happen, of course, in clouds. It can also happen at night, but once again, it's, it's making sure that we are always aware that we are paying attention to the conditions and the terrain around us. Pilots need to be aware of the fact that, you know, there's things out there that can bite you. CFIT um, is not always something that happens in instrument conditions. There's been examples of, of controlled flight and terrain in VFR conditions as well. Uh, it's all about setting your own personal limits with regard to weather or aircraft performance and the terrain that you're flying over. Did anyone ever hear of a autopilot doing exactly what it's supposed to do? A good airplane? Yeah. Um, a mountain that has never moved, it's still in the same place it was? Well, I'm going to go back oh, to really? Kermit's story on that one. And, and unfortunately, there was a recent accident talking about when, when you guys were flying formation and, and you were following someone, there's a recent accident that the initial um, report came out that that's essentially what they were doing and they were ended up with accurate forecasts, but they were not really paid attention to it, does it sound hmm. like. And the lead airplane finally said, we need to turn around, and they went one way, and the, the second airplane turned the opposite way and ended up flying, still trying to stay below the clouds, smack dab into a, into a mountain. Hmm. And, uh, and you look at it, you say, look at these weather forecasts. Why were you even in those mountains? Of course, once again, yeah. 2020 hindsight, we weren't there. However, you know, it's, it's all of these. It's VMC and IMC. They both had perfectly capable instrument mm. airplanes. However, the icing situation made it such that they could not go up into the clouds because it was the, the clouds had ice in them and they didn't want. So they chose not to go into that brick wall. However, you know, it just ended up in a control flight into terrain accident. And, you know, so once again, that pre-flight preparation and planning, if that rock in a hard place is a, is a mountain or getting ice on your, on your airplane and it's not certificated for flight and unknown icing, you know, we might want to take a different course of action. You know, and going back to what Carmen was saying with having a way out, right. you know, it was, I mean, so many times, you know, obviously, GA pilots, and, and it's windy, you know, in the Rockies or, you know, around there, and they give themselves about, you know, 2,000 feet of clearance, which might seem like a lot of space. But when you're dealing with updrafts and downdrafts, I mean, you can easily yeah. trap yourself yeah. into a situation you right. can't come out of. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you, and it could be clear skies, you know, and, and, you know, they don't take that into consideration of just how dangerous that is, but even more so importantly, having a way out when you're in those conditions. Yeah. 
You know, something uh, that just came to me when you repeated that way out scenario was the, you know, ice fly competition in our bags. I used to, there was a lot of time on the ground because a lot of times the weather was bad or, you know, we would only practice, say, maybe three times a day. So there was some downtime. So I always used to take my guitar and my banjo with me when I had a two-place pits, I'd take the front stick out. So I could, I could, you know, not multitask, but I could, you know, I could work on something. But when I got the single-place pits, you know, I couldn't fit the guitar and the banjo in there, so I literally went out and bought a fiddle because I could put it behind the seat. And so I started learning how to play the violin. But, you know, if you have a great book or you've got something to work on, a project or something, you know, then all of a sudden you go, well, hey, I don't have to be anywhere. You know, here, let me go, let me go curl up somewhere and finish that great book I was reading or something. So, so you know, not only give yourself an out from a weather point of view or a safety point of view from uh, from weather, but, you know, give yourself an out in your bag that, hey, I can go do something and catch up on something, you know, or, you know, if you got your laptop with you, you know, you can work on the Internet and get caught up something. So, you know, maybe there's different ways to, to give yourself an out. That's great. Okay, just one more question. What I've, what I've been listening to is, it seems like we're talking about pilots that seem to be compelled to get somewhere. Almost like it's they're being driven, they have to get there. What recommendations would you make to people, or how, how would they fight that? I don't want to call it get home items, I think that's what we call it in the yeah. industry. But how, what kind of safeguards could you come up with? I, I think of, Kermit just gave the best example to have something else mm -hmm. planned for if you can't go that day or the next day. I, I think that was excellent. It takes that external pressures off. So you know you might get stuck, take your, your laptop computer. We can, we can work anywhere. I, I mean, I, I think the good book, the guitar, the flute, whatever it is, I think that is an excellent, excellent example. So that, that, that'll change our focus of attention on something that we can do versus what it is we can't do. So we don't, we don't try to push that, I've got to go, I've got to go. So we're looking at what we can do versus what we can't do. And it, it yep. keeps it positive all the way around. Good. I think that's excellent, excellent. I would say in addition to that, you know, uh, each pilot has, you know, has to create their own checklist uh, uh, for those kind of situations. For example, for me, I do a lot of public speaking. You know, it's one of the things I do. And there are times where you have to fly from point A to point B, and you have to be there regardless. You're being paid for this. So talk about pressure. And when there are times when, when I see okay, my window of opportunity, it's getting smaller and smaller. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if I see I have to be in North Carolina one day and Dallas the next day, more than likely I'll just take the airlines rather than fly because I don't want to even set myself up in a situation where I have to get there. Mm -hmm. And if there's a situation where, okay, I have to be at a particular event, I'll tr I'll, I always plan to be somewhere a day, at least a day before. So I have you know a day or so to play with. Um, and, and also the same thing on departure, have another day or so to play with. And, and creating that kind of checklist for yourself uh, uh, really helps. And, and, you know, when it boils down to it and saying no, you know, as pilots, we have to keep things in perspective. You know, we all have families, we have responsibilities, and you want to come back home to, to that. And, and uh, it's not worth it. At the end of the day, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yep. What, what's the what's what's the downside if I don't make it? You know, I mean, really, what's the downside? You know, think of but you know, it's like uh, giving up, uh, going on a diet or quitting smoking or something like that. What 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 what? You have to come up with a scenario that is that gives you a reason for going. You know, I mean, why do I want to force this weather issue if you know I'm never going to see my daughter? grow up and get married or something, you know, I mean, you know, you can put uh, put it in a different light and give it some meaning that makes exactly. meaning to you that says, you know, I don't need to do this. That's an excellent point. Yeah.